Dear Mr. Nordhoff, I cannot describe my mood when I learned of your departure. I'm not ashamed to say that I cried when the choir master read your letter to the choir. Es würde mir zu Gewissheit. Gottes Wille kennt kein Warum. I accepted it as fact. God's will knows no why. Ich wollte tapfer sein, das Unvermeidliche tragen und doch musste ich unterlegen. Nun sagen Sie mir bitte, aber es in Ihrem Interesse liegt. I wanted to be courageous, bearing the unavoidable, but I had to succumb. Now tell me please whether it is in your interest that we get to know each other more closely, to test each other. Dear Miss Lauber, Our correspondence has reached a point beyond which it can only be advantageously conducted if we are completely honest with ourselves and each other. And this condition forces me to decide whether I, for the first time in my life, should trust a person with things that I have heretofore kept for myself at the very depths of the shrine of my heart. Wir leben in einer schweren Zeit. Trug und Schein verhüllen die Wahrheit. Alle Menschen tragen irgendwelche hard times. Swindles and shams cloak the truth. Everyone wears some kind of mask. Raw lust and cupidity show up everywhere. And it is a stroke of luck, a blessing, if one can remain straight and unbowed, if one does not succumb to temptation and can salvage one's faith and yearning for what is good, true and noble. Hello, my name is Dr. Jennifer Friend, and I will be talking with you today about documentary film as research and looking at ways that documentary film could be used as the next step in qualitative research methods in order to illuminate issues of social justice. The objectives for this podcast include exploring the unique contribution to traditional qualitative research methods that documentary film can have through illuminating these issues of social justice and inequities in society in ways that can be done through video production and not necessarily as powerfully uh, done through writing and traditional methods of research. Also, we'll look at ways to use video production to explore and make accessible the different truths and realities that diverse uh, mem members of society bring through their different backgrounds and experiences. A definition of qualitative research, according to Cresswell, is that qualitative research, as opposed to quantitative research that deals more with statistics, Uh, that qualitative research is an inquiry approach that's useful for exploring and understanding a central phenomenon. So the findings from qualitative research uh, may not be generalizable to large populations of society as when you're working with a quantitative data set. But in terms of the way you approach this type of research, the researcher would in invite participants to answer some broad general questions or they might collect detailed views of participants in the form of both words and images. And they could analyze this information to identify different themes that emerge from the qualitative data. From the data, then, through interpreting the meaning of the information, the researcher might draw on their own personal reflections. They may draw on past research studies and what those findings have been, uh, looking at context or theory that undergirds that work. And then the final structure of a qualitative research report is flexible. It may include a, a statement about the researcher's biases or thoughts, what the researcher brings to that work. Um, and so typically this research might be published in a journal that is reviewed by other scholars, so it's accepted as a sound qualitative research study and published in a journal. It also might be presented at a conference where different scholars or researchers and practitioners might get together to talk about findings from the research. And there's a picture there of a recent conference that I attended and worked as a member of a panel to talk about the use of technology in education. In terms of video ethnography, 
which is a form of qualitative research. Um, researchers have used video as a research tool for many decades, and it has provided accessibility to a wider audience than those traditional journal publications. And with the advances in technology, like lightweight digital video equipment and desktop video editing software, you can make a, a video just using an iPad, for example. And so these have expanded opportunities for investigators, researchers, to engage in video research methods. St. Pierre published an article recently where she devised the idea of a post-qualitative approach to research that could challenge some of the conventional or traditional qualitative inquiry methods, which she argued have become overdetermined by the publishing industry, the university research courses, and journal and books that detail very carefully what qualitative inquiry is and how to do it. So one of the things we'll talk about in this podcast and we'll practice through this project is looking at film as a post-modernist project, incorporating what St. Pierre was talking about as moving beyond the traditional qualitative research methods to use film in a way that can incorporate or reconstruct borders of different disciplines, looking at different research paradigms or mental models, geographic locations, and diverse cultures. Film has the capacity to capture authentic voices and lived experiences of diverse community members who bring these different perspectives, uh, their knowledge, their experiences, and this then has the potential to contribute uh, through a lens of equity and democracy in the final product. A definition of documentary film in its most basic sense uh, is that it allows filmmakers to record actions and events that unfold naturally and the idea for the validity of a documentary film in terms of it being close to the reality is that there is minimal interference of the filmmaker when you are capturing the video. However, the very process involved in making a film requires just like with the qualitative research definition earlier, that the artist, in this case, like the researcher, must manipulate this material, must interpret, must analyze, must make choices. Where are they going to set up the camera? Who are they going to invite to be in front of the camera? Uh, which video clips will they select for the final presentation? What kinds of audiences will they share the documentary film with? So all of these different choices do have different degrees of manipulation that the filmmaker would choose to impose when making the project. For example, a filmmaker who's making a documentary film may choose to appear in the film, and they may choose to embrace persuasive techniques rather than presenting something that is unbiased. Uh, Michael Moore is an example of a documentary filmmaker who seeks to influence the audience to address social issues, things ranging from gun control to health care reform. Uh, Griffiths stated that the subjective presence of the filmmaker in the frame, so they appear in the film, emphasizes how reality and representation are indivisible, um, that this is a subjective medium. And when you do create that documentary film, you are having the film viewed by an audience, and there are many possible meanings that can be determined by both the film itself and the possible meanings based on the social and world context outside of the film. In this particular project, the letters that have been turned into a theatrical performance, these are based on a world context that has a historical context to consider in addition to the present context today. Um, so all of these will play into some of that meaning making in the documentary film. Blank stated that the discourse of the documentary filmmakers focuses particularly on the transformation of the person filmed into a character. And we see this with reality TV shows today, that a person becomes a character. Uh, it should facilitate the introduction of recognizable features to the viewer, such as representations of the other, both near and different from ourselves. 
And I have a movie poster here of a documentary film from 1922 titled Nanook of the North, which looked at the Inuit people in the Arctic, um, and it was presented as a story of life in the actual Arctic, and most of it was actual recordings of the, the culture and the activities that the Inuit people engaged in. Some of it was fictionalized, so there were some scenes that were fiction, um, but overall this was an early documentary film that, that ha provided these representations that were new and different from the audience that they were intended to share this film with. The viewer who sees these images and listens to the voices of documentary film participants is filtering what they are seeing and hearing through their own prior knowledge, beliefs, and experiences. So an individual's relationships and experiences within the larger community influence their meaning making of a film. And I have a poster here of Spike Lee's film from 1997 called Four Little Girls that was based on the Ku Klux Klan's bombing of a Baptist church in Birmingham, Alabama during the Civil Rights Movement uh, that resulted in the loss of, of the lives of four young girls who were there. Um, and so if a person had lived through the civil rights, if they were a person who grew up in the segregated South during the Jim Crow era, you can imagine when they watch that film, they may have different meaning, different interpretations, different experiences than a person who may be um, a middle school student in school today, a young adolescent who is connecting with that past and the implications that it has today. This project that we are working on together uh, is also a form of arts-based inquiry, which can use dance, theater, drama, film, collage, video, photography, and it's grounded in a critical performance pedagogy. So it's actually intended to evoke some thoughtful responses that can be used um, intentionally to advance a progressive political agenda that addresses issues of social inequity through this arts-based inquiry. So in our project, we start with the letters written in Nazi Germany. Then we have these adapted into a play, which is then interpreted and enacted in a the theatrical performance. We have our audience discussion and then our video reflection. So we're recording all of this as a form of qualitative data, as a way of collecting some of these diverse perspectives and meanings that will be made throughout the event. In terms of methodology, a way of framing video production or documentary filmmaking as a form of quality research is to begin with thinking about a selection of the site. Where will you position the camera to explore the bounds of space and place where the human body can be a tool for gathering and exploring meaning and experience. Then the participant selection and informed consent that it's important to have sampling procedures to identify a community of learners who will be engaging with the film and to obtain informed consent so they understand these video recordings may appear on a YouTube channel, on the internet, um, so that they give permission for this video to be not only be recorded but then also how it will be shared with an audience. Participant selection might be based on intensity sampling, which is defined by Patton as looking for information-rich cases that manifest this phenomenon intensely, but not extremely, so that you can really get some, some rich meaning and narrative from this, those participants. Next, the inquiry phase. This is where you are planning a filming schedule. You are thinking about what those protocols will be, so what kinds of reflection, reflective questions will be asked, how will we structure the performance of Act 1, and then some time to really think about and digest and reflect on that before going in to take a look at Act 2. Also, making sure that you have the production crew, the equipment, that you're going to get a high quality recording so that the audio can be heard, that the video is clear. And then the next phase, that meaning making or looking at an analysis of the video. And you're selecting the clips that best represent theory and concepts. So, and uh, St. Pierre says that when you start to get confused, you have so much video, you can go back to the text. You can reread the theory and plunge into the words of the scholars who inspire. 
And then the final phase is to share those results. The researcher sequences the video clips and completes a post-production process. They may have voiceover narration. They may introduce title cards, uh, have some still photographs or a digital animation. And this helps to create the documentary film. Then they seek venues with which to share this, the results with an audience. It may be a YouTube channel. It may be um, a DVD. This is how I, uh, when I first started working with documentary film, I would get my own DVD cases and, and press the DVDs and share them with schools and districts and people in my, in my field. but it is important always to make sure that you have the consent, the media release. If you're working with minors, people under the age of 18, that a parent or legal guardian, um, and that that release is in the participant's native language to make sure that there is, that there's comprehension of that. Films are highly accessible to a wide audience. And so this increase in the general level of appreciation of how documentary film works has also led to many differing views and judgments about these ethical considerations when you're making a film. One person's acceptable technique, such as with uh, the Nanook of the North using some fiction scenes, that may be another person's unacceptable exploitation. Uh, so this is another uh, important consideration, the truth and reality in documentary filmmaking, such as the techniques that are associated, where you have music that may intentionally be selected to evoke an emotional response from the audience, voiceover narration that is providing an explanation that shapes the meaning that's made from the audience rather than presenting the raw footage and allowing that audience member to determine for themselves what, the, what meaning they make from that. All of these can enhance a documentary's ability to both present the truth and also to obfuscate the truth. In terms of measuring the impact of a film, another consideration is to think about how do you measure the impact? What data show the film's role to impact social change most clearly? The documentary film has tensions, especially in the academy, in the world of scholarship, where quantitative, or those data-driven methods, still remain the dominant mode of research. Um, according to Ha and Hadfield, uh, they, current discourses tend to position video in either purely a data collection tool or a methodological novelty capable of serving almost any purpose, like video production is the Swiss army knife of qualitative research. Film allows the audience for qualitative inquiry to extend beyond the academic community, beyond those who are attending conferences and reading those scholarly journals, and to clarify complexities that are often hard to derive from reading a text. We have overworked qualitative research, according to St. Pierre, and it has now been overworked to the extent that it blocks our thinking and we can't see the new. We are stuck. So expanding traditional research methods and venues, such as this project, uh, allows documentary film to find a home of its own within academia.